Hi, hello everyone, and uh, uh, welcome uh, to uh, our webinar on emerging topics in forensic nursing. My name is Olga Rosenman. I'm head of marketing here at Mobile ODT, and we have uh, with us our uh, forensics expert, the longtime user uh, of the EVA technology, Morgan uh, Stevens. She's a uh, a Kansas, Kansas IFN chapter president and forensic program coordinator. Uh, in a moment, I will uh, uh, hand over the webinar to Morgan. Just a few words uh, about uh, uh, mobile ODT. Uh, so many of you know uh, mobile ODT as uh, uh, the company behind Eva Sain, our sexual assault forensics a visualization and documentation technology. And uh, uh, Morgan uh, will share her experience uh, uh, with the system uh, uh, today. Uh, Eva Sane is actually a leading SANE technology in the US. It, uh, it is used by uh, uh, thousands of users, actually uh, 332,000 images, forensic images were taken with the uh, Eva system Morgan will share today uh, how it can be used for uh, forensic nursing. Uh, apart from the uh, sexual assault forensics, uh, Mobile ODT is a, actually a women's health company. We have a number of products. Uh, these products are sold in uh, over 50 countries uh, all over uh, the world and also um, uh, in, uh, implemented in the leading organizations in the US. Uh, we specialize uh, in women's health, particularly in a, a cervical cancer. We provide, apart from the forensic part, we provide a complete solution for all cervical cancer needs. Uh, uh, we have the uh, colposcope technology, which is the same technology that is used uh, in sexual assault forensics. And uh, uh, apart from this diagnostic technology, we have also the treatment solution, which is thermoglide, a thermocoagulator for precancerous lesions. We, and we have also Delphi, which is an HPV uh, antigen test. So those of you who are interested more in the COPO part, uh, we would be happy to share with you information on that uh, later. But those of you who are looking to learn more about uh, uh, sexual assault forensics, uh, without further ado, I wanted to uh, introduce and actually to uh, hang over the uh, presentation uh, to Morgan Stevens, uh, who, as I said, uh, she's uh, one of the leading experts in the sexual assault forensic domain. And we particularly love, love to work with, uh, with Morgan. She, she's a long time user of the EVA technology. Uh, so Morgan, uh, the floor is yours. We're so happy to have you with us. Hi everybody, it's wonderful to be here. I'm gonna share my screen here. Do some moving around. Okay, let's see. Okay, so my question one is, can you hear me and can you see me? I hope, I hope this is all working. So, um, okay, yeah. well. okay, perfect, great. Uh, well, happy Wednesday. I am excited to be here and kind of do uh, a really surface level overview of a few um, of the special populations that we care for and then some emerging topics as well. So. Um, I do wanna give you all a trigger warning. I am gonna be using some photos from um, uh, cases. We have gotten consent from these patients to use their photos as uh, education pieces. There will be no identifying information in there, but there are photos being used. So uh, in forensics, we don't just do SANE. Uh, we are a wide variety um, specialization. And so some of the other things that we do are um, strangulation exams, uh, suspect exams, and we deal with nonverbal populations. And photos can really tell a story. And so when we're talking about especially uh, those nonverbal patients or your suspects who you're probably not going to have a whole lot of information from, 
your photos can really tell your story. But when we start, I want to start with strangulation because this is a really important topic in forensics that we um, need to discuss, but your photos can make a huge difference, especially if you're using any alternate um, light sources or filters. And we're gonna talk, a filter, talk about a filter that's built into the EVA system. Uh, you guys will actually see the visualization today. Um, I'm gonna turn the system on. You're gonna see how it's gonna work real time. Uh, but first of all, let's talk about strangulation surface level. Um, if you are in the forensics world, you know that this is, a really dangerous form of power and control that's utilized by an abuser on um, another person. And so when we talk about your vessels in your neck, um, they're pretty surface. It doesn't take a whole lot of pressure to close those vessels off. And so as we're looking at those vessels, you have the jugular veins, you have the carotid arteries, you even have a phrenic nerve in there that innervates your diaphragm. So when we're talking pressure, if you're open a pop tab, it takes 22 pounds of pressure. To squeeze the trigger of a weapon, it takes four pounds of pressure. And so um, really it's not a lot of pressure that is required to close off these vessels. Um, a nice handshake, not like you're trying to kill the other person, but a nice firm handshake where you're introducing yourself to another human being uh, is about 80 to 100 pounds of pressure. So when we're talking about those vessels, it only requires 4.4 pounds of pressure placed on the external portion of the neck to cut off the uh, external jugulars, 11 pounds to cut off the carotids. And then any of those center structures like the thyroid cartilage or the tracheal rings, um, those can be bo broken with about 33 pounds of pressure. So it doesn't require a whole lot, which means um, the uh, offender is not putting a whole lot of pressure on the neck, but you can have internal injury um, and really um, difficult um, injuries to, to photograph. So that's why uh, your photos are so important and using um, filters and uh, alternate light sources are really important too. So one of the studies that I utilize um, with uh, police academy uh, trainees is this study here. I go in and I talk to them about um, the San Diego City's Attorney's Office who did a review of 300 cases at random over a five year period. Um, they all had a history, or 89% of them had a history of domestic violence in those cases, and then 15% of that injury was sufficient to photograph. That's not very much. We understand that um, even less than that is, so 50%, um, less than 50% is going to have any injury, but even to be able to take photos of somebody who's been strangled, only about 15% of those injuries are actually photographable. And so um, they're going to be blurry, they're going to be washed out, it's going to be hard to capture. Um, but one of the benefits of using the high contrast filter with the EVA is that you can kind of capture those really light injuries. Um, when we're talking about contrast versus um, no contrast, this is kind of what it's going to look like. So the photos on the left, uh, have, these have been taken with the EVA system, um, are photos without contrast. And so these are just normal light photos in an exam room. And then the photos on the right have your high contrast. You can see how it changes the way that you see that injury. One of the important things to do when you're documenting stuff like this is to have a no contrast by the high contrast so that you know that it's one versus another. You're not changing anything. You're just changing the way that you visualize that injury. So this is one of the benefits of it. And then when we're talking about, um, you know, those blurry images or um, hard to see images, <clears throat> this is actually my kiddo. She's a cheerleader. And so she's a, a base. And so she has to catch a flyer and she, her elbow hits her arm um, every time she falls. And so she had a competition a few weekends ago. And so I said, hey, do you have that bruise on your arm? Let me take a picture of it. And she came over. And so when we talk about taking photos in a forensic way, you, you go by a rule of fours, okay? So you take a distance photo with, um, you see her elbow here, and then you have the top of her arm here. I would probably go out a little further so you can get the shoulder, kind of that joint above and below. And then um, a mid-range photo that's a little bit closer where you can kind of see that bruise. And then an up-close photo. Um, and one will be with and one will be without a ruler. I didn't have a ruler at home. So that's why both of those are there. So one with, one without. 
Um, and if you can see this picture here on the bottom left is this same picture here on the left with the contrast. You can see how blurry it is. You can see the difference though in what that injury looks like. So here's that bruise here, and then you can see that bruise here. So as we were doing some, um, some technology testing, uh, we were kind of looking at this and the support team, um, the customer support team at uh, Mobile ODT is incredible. I am not an IT girl. I use, I use support all the time. And I'm telling you that no matter what I have going on, they're always answering my questions and fixing the problem. So um, we were actually on the phone when I was taking these, these photos in a Zoom type environment and it was blurry and they and they said hey why don't you, your your flash is off turn your flash on and so this is what it looked like with the high contrast with the flash on so there's a lot of different ways that you can go in and troubleshoot your photos you can go in and um and change the way that you're taking the photo so maybe you have the the flash on and it's washing it out more um, because if I would have had the flash on in this picture, it would have been completely washed out and you wouldn't have been able to see this injury at all. But when I used it with the contrast, you could really see that injury a little better. And so it just creates a little more depth for that injury. So that's that's one of the benefits of that high contrast filter. Um, moving into suspect exams as another kind of topic that is high level in the forensic world, uh, we really want to talk about uh, what it means to do an exam on a suspect versus a victim. As forensic nurses, they are neither one or the other, right? Those terms are what the police uh, send them as or what we're collecting the samples as. So if somebody's saying that a uh, crime was perpetrated against them, that gives them the name of the victim. They're a patient to us either way. Usually the suspect is going to come in in custody and so you can have a warrant collection or a consent collection. Either way, you have to have written consent. It's very important to have that written consent saying, you know, I gave them all of the information about what this exam is going to look like. And then um, they say yes or no. This is exactly like giving informed consent for surgery. You're giving them all the risks and benefits. And, you know, that includes me sitting down with this patient and saying, um, I have this warrant. It's saying I need to collect this evidence from you. That does not mean that I am compelled to collect that. That means you're compelled to give it. And so if you don't want me to collect it, then that falls on the police officers and then I am removed from the situation. Or I can collect these samples from you and then I hand them over to you. That's your choice. Um, and then you get consent from that patient. So if it's somebody who comes in, which sometimes this happens, we've had this happen a couple of times, and they can, they can come in and they say, I want you to do this, I didn't do it. Um, and so that's just a consent exam and you just have them sign consents and you would collect like you would like normal. Uh, when you have that warrant consent, it's gonna guide each piece of collection for you. It's gonna tell you exactly what you need to collect from that person. And so, in performing a victim or a suspect exam, you are doing things the same exact way. It's no different. We remain unbiased because we don't know what happened. And so you're going to treat that suspect the same way you're going to treat the victim. You're going to have minimal information, however, where with um, somebody who you're doing a uh, victim kit on will give you a narrative of what happened. You can, um, you are going to have minimal information, mostly that you're going to get from law enforcement about what has happened, and then they're gonna guide you through that warrant. But it's really important to remain unbiased, okay? So the uh, photography that we're gonna do can really help you take photos because if there's photos on the warrant or if, if it's a consent exam, you can collect photos. And if there's photos on that warrant, then you're gonna, you know, with your head to toe exam, you're gonna take photos of any injuries that may occur. <clears throat> In terms of nonverbal patients, we look at, you know, it's the same as with um, a low level of information. You are not really getting any information from these people. And so it can really tell a story. So if it depends on like with kiddos developmental level, can they identify pain? Because that is, that's a positive finding. If a patient has pain, it's a positive finding because it's not a uh, normal finding. It's an abnormal finding. So you would consider it a positive finding. And so with my patients who have pain and maybe were grabbed, but they don't currently have an injury, I'll have them point to the area and I'll take a picture. 
and I'll say positive pain located at this place with the photo, because then if they go and take follow-up photography, maybe an injury has occurred 12, 24, 48 hours later, and that follows the chain of how an injury pattern progresses. So you can um, utilize pain as a positive finding. And then if we're talking um, about the elderly population, uh, also don't forget with these nonverbal patients, these, these specifically, these are all vulnerable populations. And so they require a mandated report. And so however that looks for you, whether you get your social work involved, which is what we do, we're really, really lucky to work really close with them, or you're making the report, um, that's at least in the United States, can't speak to anywhere else. So um, just make sure that you are uh, involving the proper people for a mandated report. But with um, the elderly population, you have to consider disease process. Um, so things like dementia or nonverbal cues. Um, one nonverbal cue that, that I wanna talk about is a case study with one of my, uh, I had an autistic adult come in who there was a suspected sexual abuse and so she was nonverbal. She was not, she was not speaking to us. However, there was some medical care that needed to be done at first. And we thought if the forensic nurse could help with that, that maybe build a rapport. Um, and so we had taken photos of her hair and photos of her back, of bruising, those kinds of things. Her feet had feces on them. So we wanted to get a good photo of that. Um, when we went to figure out whether or not we were going to be able to do any genital photography or genital evaluation or uh, any swab collection, um, we really have to use assent here. We'll go over in the next slide the difference between consent and assent, but um, in this situation we had to change a brief that she was wearing because she was wearing a brief and it needed to be changed because it was wet and she did not even want us to do that. So there were actually two of us involved in this case because we wanted to make sure that we had one another to bounce um, what we were thinking off of each other, to work as a team, to make her feel comfortable. If one of us could, had to leave the room, the other one could stay in and provide you know, just that bedside support. And so um, she did not want us to remove that brief. So you know, we found we took that as a um, um, a lack of assent to move on with that evaluation. Um, and uh, eventually, you know, that piece didn't play a role because of all of the other things that happened. But we didn't know all of the other things that happened, right? We just have this one piece that we have to focus on. But photography was really important in that situation. She had lice in her hair, she had bruising, she had that feces on her feet. And so photography is really, really important when you're talking about caring for a patient who um, is nonverbal. So in terms of somebody being nonverbal and providing consent or assent, that is one of the reasons that I didn't use those photos is because I couldn't get consent from her to use her photos as um, education. And so um, when you're talking about consent, it's the legal definition. And that can come from somebody's legal guardian, their DPOA, it comes from the patient themselves. And so um, that is the legal portion of um, getting the okay to do an exam. In terms of assent, that means that the person is agreeable um, in the moment to do it. And these are fluid, assent is fluid. That can be verbalized. Yes, I'm okay with moving on, um, those kinds of things. It can be a kiddo saying they're okay with the exam. Um, it can be uh, a lack of assent in that situation where I had the patient who didn't even want us to remove her brief to take care of her medically. So, um, Consent uh, is legal, assent is fluid. So they get to say yes or no to every single piece. And that doesn't matter if you're taking care of um, somebody who's considered a victim or somebody who's considered a suspect. So remembering those um, differences is really important. So I think we already kind of talked about that victim and suspect um, and then consent versus assent. It does not matter. Uh, in the state of Kansas, we follow a nurse practice act, and that means that we have to get consent from our patients to treat them, right? So any patient that comes in that I'm going to see is a patient in front of me. I don't know what has happened outside of these walls, and that's how I move forward. So I have to get consent from my patient, um, and then that assent is fluid. Okay, so I want to just go over those just surface level things um, pretty quickly. Uh, but we are going to get some visuals on the EVA system, and I'm going to kind of show you what it looks like 
um, to take photos. I have um, a practice pelvis with a speculum already inserted. I have um, some other equipment here. So let's go over the equipment first so that you can kind of see what it is. I'm gonna turn the presentation off. I'm gonna stop sharing. And then I'm gonna share. Uh, okay, wait, I'm not gonna share my screen from here just yet. I hope you guys can still see me. Oh, can you still see me okay? Yes, yes, we can still hear you. So I'm gonna go over the equipment first and I'm in my office and it's small, you know, we don't get a huge space for some of this stuff. So um, it all fits in a pretty small office. So this back here is our cart and we carry all of our tools in it. And so the first thing is that you can see me, uh, it's weird to see yourself on a screen. Um, you can see this is the mobile device. It looks like a phone, it's a Galaxy. Um, it doesn't operate as a phone and I always tell my patients that. Um, I actually show them the app that I'm using and you guys will see when I log into it that it's an app that we use on this device. The phone is disconnected. We don't use it as a phone. Um, so these photos won't go anywhere, but on the secure drive that they should be stored. So this is the device. It actually doesn't come with a case, but when I when we first got it, my team said, if you don't get a case, I'm gonna drop it and we're gonna break it. And I said, okay, I'll get a case. So I got a case um, and it just, it slides right in the case. Uh, and so this is how you take full full body photography. Um, with it outside of the colposcope. It's like normal, you just take photos, we'll look at that in a minute. And then you actually have the colposcope. So I'm gonna open it up and it comes in this fun briefcase, like, you know, like I'm carrying something um, really top secret, but it's this cool device. This is the colposcope device, okay? So uh, it's really easy to use, honestly. Um, and so when you are transferring your device into the colposcope, you actually slide this over this and then just kind of slide up a bit and it opens and the other piece goes inside. Um, and what I mean by other piece is that this, oops, this piece goes right inside and then, oh, uh oh, I hope I didn't end that. Go back to meeting uh, and then you just slide it in and that's what that looks like and it turns into um, a colposcope. Uh, I will actually show you guys what it looks like to change because you have to change capture modes and so that's what that piece of the device is. There's lots of little pieces um, and then there is a light on the colposcope that you can utilize. So this power button is for nothing but the light on the front this is excellent whenever you are doing a speculum exam and you need a little extra light, you can just pull this right over. Um, it also has your charging port here and then also a little spot where you can, if, you're, um, if you leave your device inside the colposcope, you can charge it um, that way. And then here as well. So, oh, right there. So it's, when it slides in, you can charge it underneath. So as I'm showing you the bottom of this, it comes with a stand. Whoa, I'm caught. Here's what your stand looks like. And uh, one of the things that I found with this stand is there's a little bit of a, um, a trick to it. So there's a button here. See that, I'm gonna turn it sideways. There's a little button right here that you push. It doesn't take a whole lot. I actually had the colposcope in this and I bumped it and it slid right out. So you have to be really careful. So this piece right here is, um, it's a screw. So you pop up this little thing back here and you plug it in and then you screw it in. So that's what it looks like in and then you can slide it and your device goes in and your hands free. You can move it um, up and down. There's a knob down here. There's a knob right here to move it up and down. It just um, tightens and loosens so you can go up and down. And then this knob right here actually moves the camera for you. It's a little loose. So just make sure you wanna make sure that all of your pieces have the appropriate, um, that one needed a little tightened have the appropriate screws and things in it so that it doesn't move. But then this lets you move the actual camera around so that you can be hands-free. 
one of the other benefits of the device is the Bluetooth pedal. So you can absolutely be hands-free using this pedal. I use this all the time when I'm doing my speculum exams. So you can zoom and take the photo from the left and right pedal. Um, I always feel like zoom should be left. It's not, it's on the right for us. And then you take the photo with the left side of the pedal. So if you're having to hold, you're positioning your camera and then having to hold tissue, um, you don't have to let go or get somebody else in. Um, you can just use the pedal and it's beneficial that way. Okay, so Olga, did I go over all of the equipment that I needed to? There wasn't anything else, right? She's probably like, I'm not even sitting there. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen on here so that you can actually see what it looks like to play in the system. So this is our home screen. And once again, um, I am not a big IT person um, and I will not, uh, I will never not admit that. Um, so this screen actually had like three different screens to, to, to move through. And when we were doing our device checkup the other day, we, uh, IT helped me delete those and clean it up. And I was like, oh, this looks so much better. So um, it was great. But the Eva app, you can see here, you're just gonna click on it. And then this is, they'll set up a profile for you. And then you put in your code and it goes to um, what you would like to do for an exam. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say no save exam because that's gonna go to the, it's gonna sync it. You can see where it says sync and it's gonna sync it up to the portal. There's a um, portal that you can utilize online and we'll go look at that in a minute. It has the photos, I'm, I think I said it earlier, it has the photos of my daughter's arm on it. And so there are ways that you can take the high contrast filter on and off there. So we'll go over that in a minute, but I just synced that exam up to the portal. So as we're doing a new exam on a patient, you're gonna go to start forensic exam um, and you can customize what you want in there. No, we don't have Bluetooth currently. Um, you can customize what you put in here. So we chose medical record number and you just click next. Oh, cues are not in medical record. Of course, last name and then first name and then next, but you can also skip them. So if I didn't wanna put their, um, say they're antsy and they're ready to get out of there. I'm like, you don't have time to put all this information in. You can skip and go and add it later. So I'm gonna skip these. And then that is all the information that you decide to put in the patient details. These patient details are according to whatever you might collect or whatever you think is important. So it's totally customizable. So now I'm gonna start the exam. This is gonna pull up my camera. So what you're gonna see is uh, my camera. And I have some, um, some models over here that we're gonna take a look at. So this is Strangulation Susan. She uh, is our uh, mannequin that we utilize with our patients who have been strangled. And so what they'll do is they'll demonstrate how they were strangled on her and we'll take a photo of it. But what I've done with her today is I've created some injury so that you can see her injury. So as you can see, it's a little blurry. So I'm just gonna tap on the screen and it's gonna do its own thing. And it's gonna show you that injury. So I zoomed in on it. Now, there is, um, my flash is off and my high contrast filter is off. So your flash is up here at the top and um, my high contrast filter is down here on the right on the bottom. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a picture right now as it's blurry with just with the um, nothing on it, okay? so. That's gonna upload. Now let's turn the flash on. And all I did was just touch that flash and take a photo of it with the flash on. So that is a little washed out. I didn't really like the way that that looked. So let's turn the high contrast on and I'm gonna move it. And my flash is on with the high contrast. So let's do it with the flash on.
that spot is still washed out. So let's turn the flashback off and then take another picture. So you can see how you can really troubleshoot getting you know, a good picture of a bruise. When you're taking photos, you wanna go 90 degrees. So if that means we need a change in lighting, I'm gonna lay it down and you can kind of see the shadow of the phone here. So you gotta be careful in the way that you're taking the photo. I'm gonna turn that high contrast filter off. You can kind of see the shine because of the light. So you may have to turn your light off. You may have to just change positions. So um, let's get a picture here. And that's a little better, right? That is a little better photo. I like that one a little better but still kind of blurry. So sometimes you just have to play with maybe your background's not as good. So when you're taking photos, it's really, really important. I'm just gonna put my hand over this right here as I talk. It's really important not to delete anything, um, even if it's not the picture that you want. In court, if it goes to court, your prosecutors are not going to utilize the photos that don't mean anything or that you can't see anything from. And so just take photos until you have that photo that you feel is best to portray your story or best to portray what you're trying to tell. Um, and so in terms of taking uh, photos for a strangulation, we know that this probably isn't what it's gonna look like. We know that it's probably gonna look like those really light or faint bruises that you saw on my daughter's arm, if there's anything, maybe some redness, but you notice that you, if you switch your light up, if you turn your flash on, turn your flash off, use that high contrast filter, um, you can really see that uh, injury in different ways. Okay, so now we're gonna go to utilizing um, the colposcope in a pelvic exam situation. So um, I have a pelvis here that I'm gonna utilize. Let me turn this, pull this tab so that I can. Oh, I just pulled it off, hang on. Put that down for a second. Okay, now I have a light in there so you can see what's going on. So in this situation, right? So maybe we're not getting as, as good a light as we want or the picture is not as good as we want. I'm gonna adjust my lighting. It's not as good, it's washed out, it's too much. Um, and I want a good picture of the cervix. So really I'm gonna go to my colposcope mode, right? So this is for full body photography. If I was taking external genital photos because there's an injury, um, I would be utilizing this. But now we're gonna switch from the full body mode to the colposcope mode. So if you go to the settings tab, which is you'll see the X on the left, and then the settings is the next icon um, to the right of the X in between the flash, you see that capture mode. So capture mode means you're either have it outside or inside the colposcope. If you have it outside the colposcope, you want it on um, the capture mode. On the inside, you want it on colposcope mode. Now you'll see what it did was turned everything, flip turned upside down. Okay, so now I'm going to transfer it back. I'm going to transfer it into the colposcope while the camera's on so you can see what it does. Oh, I did that kind of off screen. I apologize. I transferred it into the colposcope. So that's not what I wanted to do. So now you see it's not flipped turned upside down. Um, so then you can see that I just tapped the screen and I can zoom. There's a zoom, the zoom is on the right, up and out, okay? I always bring it all the way out before I zoom in. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm going to adjust my, my stand so that I can see into my, vaginal vault and I just tightened it. Okay, now I am moving the one with the ball to look inside that vaginal vault. And I hope, I really wish I could see your guys' faces or have heard what you did just then whenever it moved <laughs> into the vaginal vault and really showed you exactly what you can see. So this is why we use the colposcope because it really gives you 
a good visual of that vaginal vault. It's a tunnel, right? It's hard to take photos of. And so this magnifies it, but it also gives you a really clear photo. So this is this um, piece right here is a, a light that is comes with our speculum that we utilize. I'm going to remove that light and let you see what it looks like to use the light that comes on the coposcope. So that's the light that comes on the coposcope if you don't have any other lighting. Um, and you can adjust as well. So if I want to move this up just a smidge so that I can get a better picture, um, you can. They also have, I'm going to go to the settings button again, a hand wave um, option. So this hand wave option, if you turn it on, and I'm sitting behind the camera, you can see me sitting behind the camera, all I have to do is wave my hand across it, see if it's going to work for me. I don't use this one because I wave my hand too much. And it takes a picture. So your hand's free. Um, so you're not touching anything. So like if I touch it, it moves a little bit. So, and I, I don't wanna do, I don't wanna um, move it at all. I'm just gonna use the, the hand wave motion. And of course, whenever I don't want it to do it all the time, it does it. Um, so let's go back and turn off that hand wave motion. This is a really good place where you use the, the Bluetooth um, the Bluetooth pedal. And so um, it's not on right now, but if I had it on and it were Bluetooth, the Bluetooth, um, I'm not in an exam or am I in an exam? I wonder, I told me not to do it. I'm not gonna do it. Cause I, I inevitably I would mess something up. So you just flip, there's an on button. And when you're in an exam, it actually just hooks right up to the system. And then I don't have to touch. I can just tap um, and it'll zoom or, and then um, tap and it'll take a picture. Or you can touch the screen to take a picture. So in this situation, I'm gonna touch the screen to take a photo and it moved a little bit, but that picture is just fine, right? So say I needed to get closer or I wanted to zoom in, um, you just would tap. Let's see if my screen's gonna let me do it. It's not gonna let me do it. Okay, so your motion is the same as you would where you where you zoom on anything, but if you can't use your fingers because you've just touched tissue on somebody's genitals, that's not really beneficial. So that's why the pedal is really beneficial in this situation. So you can zoom as much as you want. So say there was an injury, there's not really a cervix in this because this model is, is not a medical grade mannequin with a cervix. Um, but if I wanted to, like that's kind of blurry, right? So I'm gonna back out just a smidge and I'm gonna touch it and see if it'll uh, readjust. But you, if you really wanted to get close, you could get close. I wanna zoom in on an injury, you can zoom in on an injury and really take your time in photographing within a vaginal vault um, or getting pictures of the, the vaginal walls or the lining. I can move this whole stand closer and adjust to get any kind of photo I want. So now I'm going to zoom in a little bit and just tap my screen to have it. Okay, sometimes I go too fast. So that's not the picture that I want. So I'm going to move my stand out. Oh yeah, there we go. That's much better but my camera is, there we go, let's tighten it. There, that's the picture that I want. So I'm just gonna take a photo and you can see when I touched the screen, it moved a little bit. So that is what it looks like to use it. You can turn your high contrast filter on here if you had bruising on the surfix. Um, if you wanted to get a picture of an injury that's just a little bit different, that's what it looks like to use the system within the stand, the colposcope, and um, for full body photos. Okay, I'm going to come, uh, I'm going to turn this one off, see if I can do it. It's not going to let me, I got to take it out. And stop sharing this, and then I'm going to reshare my screen so that you guys can see the portal. Okay.
Okay, so here's the portal. Um, this comes with uh, a lot of features in it. So you'll have an email you set up. Oh man, I totally thought I wasn't going to do that on the first time. So you'll see that the case that we just did with um, in that I synced up is already in here. But I want to go into this one. So this shows all of your patients. Of course, you have a support button. Um, you can download all of your exams to your um, to your computer or where you want to download them in bulk if you want to. We do them separately. Um, and they are, don't forget that your forensic photography needs to be stored in a different secure space um, because it's considered pornography. So um, you're releasing your photos differently than you're releasing um, your medical records, depending on how your facility does it. Okay, so you can go into your exam. All your exam details are going to be here. And so Here's your clinical impression. You can edit all of these if you want to. If you um, don't want to, you don't have to. It doesn't show up whenever you download them. But those patient details are here at the top. And then we go down to the media files. Now, if there were more, I would need to expand it out. There's going to be a button here that says see all. And so you have to expand it out to see everything. Because if you click select and then select all, it's only going to select what you can see. So that's a little um, a little tidbit that I've learned. Okay, so let's cancel this. So now I want to go into this photo, right? We realized that this photo was blurry before, right? So I wanted to take a better photo. So now we're at the high contrast position. I, it is already showing that it's in high contrast. So I want to take that off. So that's what it looks like without high contrast. And this is what it looks like with high contrast. Now, depending on how you document um, in your system or on paper, you can add an annotation to your picture. So I can say, if I had a, um, if I had a ruler, I could say circular bruise, two centimeters by two centimeters. And that annotation is gonna stay on there, right there. So you can document on your image if you want to, um, or you can delete it and it'll come off. Um, but you can turn this on and off. And then another thing that you can do is a green filter. The green filters are used a little bit more for um, women's health and OB-GYN. Um, we wouldn't use them very often just because it doesn't show that bruise as well as the high contrast does. There's not really a difference or um, a benefit in using the green filter. It's not gonna give you any more or less information than this photo does. So um, we don't use the green filter often, but this is an option for the women's health um, side of things. So that's what the portal looks like. Um, you can download just the single photo or you can download them all. So the way that you do it is you go to select, select all, and then download and it just downloads into your system. So it's going to take a minute. Um, you just go to your files. I'm not going to do it um, because I, I, there's no reason to, but um, you just go into your downloaded stuff and then you move them to whatever file you would like them in. So that's as easy as it is to utilize the system. And some of the benefits of um, using the EVA system for those vulnerable populations of patients. Um, I think we're gonna open it up to questions. I wanted to leave it open for questions. I can't remember if we were um, to go to 115 or one. So I wanted to make sure I didn't go too long. Yeah, yeah, we do have. So first of all, thank you, Morgan. Yeah, I, I think it was amazing both to learn on the forensic experience and all the things that, that you have shown with the EVA system. Really, really uh, impressive. Uh, we have uh, some questions uh, uh, for, from the participants and also you're, you're welcome to, uh, to write more. So okay. the first question is, uh, what would you say is the biggest difference in picture quality from using a digital camera? 
Um, so I can compare it to if you're going to take a photo on your iPhone to a professional photo. Um, these, the camera on the, the Samsung is no different than if I were going to be taking it with um, a big bulky camera. And, and um, I would equate that. So the qualities are, are very similar, uh, but you're not going to have as many bulky things to carry around. So let me just show you, because we do have a briefcase with, a, with our ALS filters and our camera in it. So <laughs> all equipped. Why do they make these briefcases like so ginormous? Okay, so this is just our ALS filters for a normal camera. And then this is the briefcase with just your normal camera and all your supplies in it. So your lights, your cords, your filters, all of that good stuff is in this ginormous um, box, whereas everything is kind of contained in the system, in the EVA system. So picture quality is um, similar to if you were taking it with a, a normal camera. Oh, you know what? Well, God, I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. Ask another question. Is there another question? Oh, yes, yes, uh, sure. So uh, another question is about uh, uh, the video. Uh, so you have shared so far uh, that, that you can take images. Is there also a possibility to take video? Yes, there is the ability to take video. We do not do that with adults and adolescents. And at my facility, we um, only see adults and adolescents. But I would see it as a benefit if you were doing child exams and you needed to video an exam that you were doing. I know a coordinator um, in the state of Kansas who videos every one of their child exams. So this would be a benefit. And you could just put it on the stand and um, video while you're doing your exam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there is another question. If if, if you have the, the teleconsultation mode, so so this, this is what you shared is actually the, the telesec, this is the teleconsultation. Oh, yes, yes. Um, what I did today was uh, in the Zoom app, and that is the, the telesane mode. So this is a great system for telesane because your, um, your forensic professional can be on one end while they're seeing exactly what you're seeing on the other end. So you're um, as I was moving, you know, the system and you guys could see exactly what I was doing, that's exactly what it would look like with a telesane. Okay, good. Uh, another question, any tips to eliminating the delay when you press capture? Um, so it looks like there's a delay because of the, um, because of the webinar, there's not a delay. So I think what it looked like that there was a delay when I pushed it, but there's there's not really a delay when you push the picture, it it captures that image and then sends it to the system. Mm -hmm. But there looks like there's a delay because of the webinar. We <laughs> were talking about that earlier. <laughs> right, right. Uh, do you still take a photo of the ID card before and after the group of photos? And do you still photo the patient closes before PE? Yes, you always want to do your bookends. So that is um, patient label um, before and at the end. And that just says that this set of photos is this patient's. Um, and then definitely uh, the you want a full body of the patient in, at first. But also think about, too, if they come in with clothing um, that's disheveled, uh, and they're telling you maybe that they ran or they ran out of the house. I think a good example that one of our um, coordinators in the city uses is that one girl told her that she um, she reclasped her bra on the outside of her t-shirt and she came in like that. So instead of just having her undress, she took a photo of that and was able to tell that story. So yes, do your bookends. You want to do um, uh, an initial shot of your patient and then consider um, if, you know, what they look like prior to um, bagging their clothes would be beneficial. 
We have a, a here a question a, about uh, actually from uh, from the UK about uh, no it's not for you Morgan <laughs> it's about the uh, the cost in GDP and uh, where is the data stored uh, uh, in yeah, terms of GDPR so we'll get back to you via email uh, on that our customer service <laughs> we will provide uh, all the hands off on that one <laughs> yeah um, also though. I do want to say um, in terms of the portal, it had to go through a security protocol at my health system um, through our IT cybersecurity people uh, before we could utilize it and they have approved it. So there's a lot of security measures in place um, that make the portal secure. Okay, uh, great. Uh, so we had uh, a lot of questions and you shared a lot of information. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Morgan. Thank you for everyone who attended. It's amazing to see people from all around uh, the world. This is you know, a topic that, that is relevant uh, uh, to, to so many countries. So uh, thank you again, uh, Morgan. Thank you to everyone who joined. If we didn't address any of the questions, we'll be in touch with you. Uh, via email, our uh, support team uh, is here for you. I, I saw that a couple of you had questions, so we'll reach out and uh, we'll schedule a, a training session uh, wherever it's needed. It was a pleasure uh, to have this webinar. Thank you so much uh, for joining and have a good day, everyone. Thank you again, Morgan. Yes, no problem. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody, or whatever time it is, wherever you are. <laughs> Thank you so much. And the webinar is recorded, and you will get uh, the, the recording of the webinar. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.